It's an honor for me to be here in this beautiful city of Delphi. Also, it reminds me of the oracle of Delphi, and what Delphi also means is the navel of the world. OK. Better now? OK, sorry. What I meant to say is that it's a special honor to be here in Delphi. The oracle of Delphi comes to mind, and also it, the, world mean, the word means uh, the navel of the world. There are several other navels of the world that come to mind, like Cusco in the Andes in Peru was for the ancient Incas and their predecessors was also the navel of the world. And Napa Rui, or better known as uh, Easter Island in the South Pacific, is for the Polynesian isle, uh, people, is also the uh, navel of the world. So one could conclude that, uh, that every great nation, every great culture, sees themselves as the center of the universe. And I guess that makes them great cultures. And so is Greece, a great culture. And just on a philosophical little note, I think cultures take thousands of years to develop. What we were talking about and what concerns us now are economic phases and political phases of war that are forgotten after a few hundred years. But what really has the power our cultures, they're here to stay, and we should make sure that they don't go away, particularly the Greek culture, because we should not forget that the Greek culture gave Europe its name and is the background for the European values and the European ethics that, it, that comes out of Greece. This is just a little ode to culture which has an enormous power. Now, what are we confronted with today is the globalization. And the globalization, basically, that we are living is like a fetish of the neoliberals. The neoliberals who want to reduce the world to one culture, to one set of values, all based on greed, consumption, and maximizing profits. Neoliberalism was born only about 30 years ago by the Washington Consensus, actually less than 30 years ago in 18, uh, 18, uh, 1989. But it has expand, ex expanded like brush fire around the world, particularly around, around the Western world, and today it almost totally controls it. It's a shame. Today in the West we are exploiting Mother Earth at the rate of four and a half times its natural resources. Compare this with Africa, which is about 0.6%. And much of these natural resources that we exploit, uh, and the growth of this has actually started particularly in the 80s. Mo most of it, a um, big chunk of it, goes into the military industry in the war machine. Over the past 20 years or so, much more than half of the extracted mineral resources went to the military industrial complex. We don't know that because the media don't tell us. And another shocker maybe, but it's also a fact, is that close to 50% of the US GDP depends on wars, conflicts, and, uh, and, and related uh, weapon sales to other countries. So if tomorrow peace would happen, the US economy would collapse. Neoliberalism is the killer plague of the 21st century. Neoliberalism is economic fascism. It is a criminal doctrine Globalized neoliberalism privatizes public goods for private profit. Neoliberalism led Washington 
led by Washington with the shameful complicity of Europe has in the last 15 years killed between 12 and 15 million people by wars, famine, deprived health services through privatization, for example, forced refugees. Today we have about 50 million refugees and increasing floating throughout the world and throughout refugee camps where they disappear because they are not accounted for anymore, whether they are dead or alive, by statistics. Today, a small world elite of corporate and Wall Street CEO, CEOs and selective politicians call the shots. But they use puppets to run their show. Puppets like the President of the United States, and the so-called leaders of Europe, they're nothing but puppets of this elite, this, this industrial and Wall Street elite. And they are served by a prostitute media. I call them prostitute media because they sell themselves. They are no longer honest as they used to be. Do we all realize that today, 90% of the news we receive in the West come from six giant Anglo-Saxon media corporations. Do we realize that? So we are indoctrinated day in, day out by the same news. And one could almost say with Goebbels, if a lie is repeated often enough, it becomes the truth. And whether we want it or not, this is exactly happening today, and we have heard many of these examples this morning. For example, how, uh, how Russia is slandered, and how Putin is put down and denigrated all the time. I think if it wouldn't be for Putin, we would be already in a third world war, because he is a smart, very, very diplomatic person that has, who has been avoiding conflict. He is not confrontational and therefore we have been escaping uh, a serious conflict. Maybe the Third World War with, that would have happened in Europe within 100 years was avoided, I would say, largely thanks to Mr. Putin. Yet the Western media slander him, put him down whenever they can, and the Western public believes it because they don't have access to the truth. Neoliberalism is also famine. Famine through speculation with food and agricultural staple. According to the FAO, famine and related diseases kill every five seconds a child in this world. Yet agricultural industry could aliment, could nourish 12 billion people, almost double of what we have today. Even the World Bank, who is not exactly known as a left-wing organization, even the World Bank in, nine, in a 2009 report has uh, confirmed that about 80% of the 2008 famine uh, and onwards, because it continues, had that killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, directly and indirectly, with the consequences of famine, was due to price hikes, which were due to food speculation, and food speculation goes on. It is a crime. Every child that dies from hunger is not just a death, it's a murder, because it could be nourished if we were running a different system, if we were not running a neoliberal system. I think we have to stop this. And I must say, on a very sorrow note, because I'm a Swiss citizen, last week, last Wednesday, my government rejected the people's initiative to ban food speculation. Can you imagine Switzerland? It's a shame. The referendum will anyway come to vote later on, either this year or next year, and it could still be accepted by the people. But that, that the prejudice by my government says no, it's not proven. It's a shame, and I'm ashamed. These abhorrent values are fully accepted by the world. 
we, the 99%, have become strangers to our own inherent and intrinsic values. Strangers, we don't know them anymore because we have been derailed by the media and by neoliberalism. For example, look at this. The US Congress debates whether torture should be legalized or not. This debate is going on. Maybe it has just finished, but it's going on during the last day. Whether torture should be legalized. Why is a subject like that even deserves to be discussed? Or the opponents, and there are of course lots of opponents of the system, so-called opponents. They debate about drone killings of civilians. They do not condemn drone killings as a crime of humanity, but they lament and merrily discuss the ratio of killed civilians versus so-called terrorists. That's what their preoccupation is. Not that drone killing, in fact, is a crime in itself. This is horrendous. This is horrendous. That's how far our mind has swayed away. So, these minds have been contaminated by the new normal. I call it the new normal because it's really a new normal that has grown during the last 15, 20 years or 30 years that we know neoliberalism. They only see the drops of blood that emanate from the hemorrhage, but they lost the human sense and do not understand anymore that the hemorrhage itself has to be stopped. Wars, too, around the world have become normal. At best, we debate about the errors of war, not the crime of war per se. We discuss whether the killing is okay. Well, the killing is okay. It's just how we kill and whom we kill. That's being debated. But war, whether it should exist or not, it's become a natural. We don't even debate anymore. This is something that has to do with our consciousness. It has changed. And we should find back again to our, to our own selves, our own intrinsic values. And I refer to that again because cultures instinct, instill in one, in, in you and in me and in us, values, basic values. That's what Greece has done with the European great basic values uh, centuries ago, many, many centuries ago. And so Greece is very important for Europe. Greece is the key for Europe. And I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here. I'm saying this because we should become conscious. And I'm seeing me, I'm sure pretty, pretty much we in this room, we are conscious. But our neoliberal, uh, how shall I call, call them? Enemies that run the world, they are not conscious anymore. Friends, 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 we are, work, we are living in a sick, in a very sick world. We are listening to so-called leaders who are in reality stooges of an empire that has no soul. And these are our so-called leaders of the European Union. We are watching, basically without voice, we are watching how the EU, with the help of the IMF, the extended branch of the Federal Reserve and Wall Street, that's what the IMF is, let's face it, is assassinating one of her brothers. Literally assassinating it. Oh, I forget. <laughs> uh, the term of we has been, we, we as a community, has been uh, obliterated. It's on the eyes now, the fractured eyes. The Greek culture, like any other nation in the European Union, must live on. Greece must not be subdued to financial tyrants of Brussels and Washington and left alone by her brothers of the Union. Greece should be part of a common solidarity. And Greece is supposed and should become, again, a sovereign nation, a sovereignty that it has lost through the imposed debt. Today it is Greece, tomorrow it may be Portugal and uh, 
uh, Ireland, or Spain. Friends, it is absurd to even remotely believe that the Troika, the ECB, the European Commission, and the IMF wanted the good for Greece at any time during the past seven years. Today's Greece's debt amounts to, to close to 360 billion euros. It has risen since 2007 from about 108% to 175% earlier this year. You must I must work. <coughs> I have so much more to say. Your speech will be available. Yeah, but it doesn't. Okay. Okay, well, let me just tell you then a few more things which I believe is, is important to, to, to know, to put, to put Greece's debt into perspective. Uh, a debt of 108% of GDP as it was in 2008 is totally manageable. Compare this to the debt of, of about the same amount of the United States of America vis-a-vis -vis their GDP. Nobody talks about that. And that's not even the real debt. The real debt of the U.S. is what the General Accounting Office of the U.S. calls the unmet obligation. And that's about seven and a half times as large as the U.S. GDP. It, it amounts to about $130 trillion. Nobody talks about that. And, uh, well, if we know that Mr. Draghi is a former uh, executive uh, of Goldman Sachs, then we also know that basically the European, European economy and finance is run by Goldman Sachs. Why do we allow that? It is not too late. We can change it. Uh, uh? Sorry? But why are you so strict with me and all the others could talk longer? <laughs> to, to the others, I will be strict as you. <laughs> okay, let me just say something about, uh, about, about Greece. Uh, I would like to just tell Mr. Tsipras Mr. Tsipras, every day you are waiting for a concession from Brussels is not only a day wasted, but it is extending and ag aggravating the misery of millions of Greek. There is really, in my opinion, and maybe it's shared by others, only one way out. Quit the euro. Go back to the drachma or forwards to the drachma. Take your country's sovereignty back, default, and then renegotiate your debt autonomously and at your own terms. And this is not the first time. This was done by many countries before Greece, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, and would you believe it or not? By Germany, yes, by Germany. Germany, according to German economic historian Albrecht Trichel, who wrote a few days ago in the Spiegel, Germany has defaulted three times on its debt during the last century, three times. The last time it was in the 90s. He calls Germany defaults the biggest debt transgression in Europe's history. You can read it up. It's not made up. Greece's debt pales in comparison to Germany's defaults after the war. Why does nobody talk about it? Why does nobody pick it up? Because we are living with the prostitute media that are bought and do not publish facts like that. And Greece doesn't even seek massive debt forgiveness, but rather a soft restructuring of debt. But Germany, a firm believer of the Troika doctrine, is intransigent. After Greece, who would follow? Actually, there are quite a few uh, alternative options for Greece, which is, it's got, it would be too long now, but after this, I would be very happy to discuss them with any one of you. But I believe, to make it short now, there are really other alternatives for Greece. Once it has come back and renegotiates, renegotiates its debt, Greece could actually be a, a lesson for Europe. Greece could tell the European Union it could go, could go out with a high head not denigrated, not debased, 
not humiliated, as it looks like is being done by, by, by the, the masters and the kings of Washington and of Brussels. But Greece could go up with a high head saying, we can no longer wait for your concessions. We do it our own way. Mr. Tsipras could say, I owe it to my electorate that I have to revamp uh, the Greek economy. Since Europe has no solidarity, doesn't give me breathing space which I need to revamp the economy. I have to take the breathing space myself <coughs> and step out of the euro and do it our way, our sovereign way, autonomy back to Europe. Maybe that would trigger a landslide of other countries who feel anyway the same but don't dare to express it. So in that particular sense, it could be, he could even add to say, when Europe has restructured itself to become the vision that Europe wanted to be at one point, uh, a, federation, a federation of sovereign nations with perhaps an economic union, but a federation with the real central bank, because what we have as a central bank is not a central bank. It's actually a watchdog that condemns those that do not uh, adhere to, a, to a, the dictate. If Greece would be able to instill the vision again in the European Union, that they would come back eventually, maybe a smaller number of those who gain consciousness and create an, a, a real European Union in solidarity, then there would be no longer the oppression of the United States, the blackmailing of the United States, you are either with us or against us, you know, this is the rule. That, that prevails everywhere, and thanks God we have Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi who, who oppose this sort of blackmailing, then it would open up the way for nations not to have to adhere to one way, to one side, to the east or to the west, but could actually choose their partners as best they please, and that is sovereignty. So in that sense, I think Greece could be the gateway for a new Europe. Thank you very much.